It's time for the unofficial 40. Soonerscoop.com's very official recruiting podcast featuring Soonerscoop.com recruiting publisher, Josh McQuistian. Get your recruiting fix from the leader in Sooner Recruiting. It's the unofficial 40 with your hosts, Soonerscoop.com publishers, Gary Murdoch and Josh McQuistian. Welcome back, everybody. It is another edition of the Unofficial 40. It is the post-camp hell edition of the Unofficial 40. As we're joined by Josh McQuistian, Eddie Radosevich, Joe Duvall, and myself. And uh, Josh, welcome back to the program once again. And uh, I guess it's good that everybody is finally home. Yeah, it, it's a little amazing that everyone made it home after Eddie and Joe's debacle returning there. And, of course, my... Um, much publicized trip to Atlanta. So it, it was a little bit adventure in the sky for the entire Sooner Scoop staff. We were due a uh, we were due a bad travel day after what you went through getting up to Kansas City. Uh, and then, Carrie, you've had a couple of run-ins with uh, with flights and stuff here in the last couple of years, I think, going out to... Josh made me drive home all the way from Memphis in the middle of the night one night while he slept. <laughs> well, I can't, I can't bag on anybody too much for sleeping in the car while you drive. I've done that plenty of times. It's my duty. Uh, <laughs> I feel like that's my calling in life is to drive everyone in the middle of the night everywhere. I'm sure that Kerry played. He played some sort of music. There was some sort of hymn or something. I don't sleep in moving vehicles, and I slept like a baby that night. I still don't know how that happened. <laughs> well, Joe, and let me, let's me let start with you. Uh, it was kind of – I felt really bad um, because this was in, – and Josh, you can attest to this – this is a little bit like uh, Rivals Camp on steroids that you just went to. That Saturday session, they basically used to have that over two days. Now they've crammed it all into one day. Eddie, you know, you've mm-hmm. been to this stuff a lot. Yeah. Uh, and then you had the underclassmen on Sunday. But uh, just kind of, uh, let's get your impressions, Joe, of what you thought about uh, going to the Rivals Five Star Challenge. Uh, that is just a ton of quality football you're watching in a very short amount of time. I mean, it's... Uh, it's a lot to process almost for somebody to see like I mean you're going to I'm probably looking at at least 5 plus first round future draft picks a bunch of other guys that are going to be in the NFL and all Americans and these guys are just playing some absolutely fantastic football and it's over the span of one day you watch them because on Friday they just had like an orientation and all that stuff going out having fun at like a game X which is like a Dave and Buster's kind of place and then Saturday, the uh, the grind started from basically uh, dawn till dusk. We uh, got up in the morning, went to the Georgia Dome, watched some football, and then seven on sevens ended at what ten o'clock at night. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a lot in in forty eight hours, I guess, or twenty four hours, really. It's really seventy two. I mean, you you put media day yeah. in there and the the hustle and bustle of that, then having to get up in your hotel room and and edit video and write yeah. stories and break it all down and and uh, then you know. I guess you guys went to Cubs game. Yeah, we did. That Friday was night. Cool. Yeah, the only night that they just played like absolute dog crap. And then <laughs> I, the, the, the next two days they outscored the Braves twenty-one to four. Uh, but uh, the the, uh, the highlight of the the weekend might have actually been meeting David Ross's parents at the uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. at the airport bar on Sunday. But now you said you went full on fanboy. You just you just gushed. Yeah, pretty much. And I tried to talk him out of retiring, and was like, "Well, if you can tell David not to retire this year," <laughs> and the. I, that's when the dad was like, "All right, I'm gonna go to the restroom. Uh, I'll just meet you guys at the gate." <laughs> they were such baseball parents. It yeah, was they so were. Cool. They, they might as well. Their son might as well have been in little league the way they acted. It was so cool, man. Uh, Eddie's a Cubs fan, as most of you know. I'm a longtime Braves fan, and David Ross has played for both. And uh, we were just really fanboying over there, like, "Ah, oh, I love your son. He was a great fielding catcher." And I really couldn't talk about his hitting much, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> can't say that in front of his parents. It was really cool, though. That was super cool. All right, well, uh, you know, to the camps and everything's gone on, and even I guess we should start off even before we, you know, you guys got to Atlanta. Uh, you guys went down to the satellite mm-hmm. camps on Friday. It's like uh, Chris Robinson overload. I think yeah. you guys got a, a little bit of. We we are nearing the uh, the Justice Hansen area of uh, Scoop HD on Chris Robinson. Yeah. We're, we we're gonna have enough to uh, write or to put together a short documentary. Hopefully, it turns out better for him. Yeah, I think it it, it might. 
I, I really like Chris, though. He was, uh, I was kind of surprised. I don't know about Josh and Joe, but I was really surprised that he even came out to uh, the, the Mesquite camp, especially after getting back from the Elite 11. And, uh, you know, I, I talking with Josh in his interview, I was really surprised that I think it was something that hasn't really been made that much public in that uh, Chris Robinson will be a mid-year enrollee and, and just how everything shook out with, with Baker Mayfield getting the extra year of eligibility. I mean, Josh, what do you think about talking to him? And he sounds like he's very much pro-OU uh, no matter what happens here in the next uh, six months with uh, Lincoln Riley. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, and, and that was something that I wanted to ask him about because there's been a lot of talk that, oh, you know, the Baker Mayfield ruling might negatively affect him. And I didn't really understand that, but I thought maybe there's some part of this I'm missing but Chris is a savvy kid. He understands that if Mayfield comes back for 2017, that buys him a full year on campus to really, uh, you know, envelop himself in the offense, understand all the nuance, and really become that guy that truly is a competitor rather than a really talented quarterback trying to play catch up against Kyler Murray and Austin Kendall, who have the advantages I was just talking about. So, yeah, I mean, and that's that's the way he sees it. I mean, he saw that as a good ruling for him. Made it sound like he was even more firm in his decision, though I don't think, you know, whether that ruling had gone in either direction, I don't think that would have really affected him. But what, you know, Eddie, you touched on something, and I think it's the, it's kind of the embodiment of Chris Robinson. He told me when, you know, when he got to check in at that Mesquite camp um, that he really didn't plan to work out. He was still coming off the Elite 11. He knew he had the Rivals five star that weekend. And so he was just going to kind of take it easy and not do anything. And within five minutes of being at the camp, he's out there working drills with, you know, all the rest of the coaches. Robinson just doesn't know how to take it easy. That's, that's just not his style. He doesn't really know how to work that way. And I think it's one of the reasons that in a lot of ways, he reminds me some of Baker Mayfield. He kind of has that same, I want to go out there every day of every week and prove I'm the best player on any field I'm on. And that, and it's, it, it's maybe not in the same way that Mayfield really does. I mean, he has a chip on his shoulder to prove himself. Robinson's always been pretty highly thought of and pretty believed in. But I think in a lot of ways, he uses the same motivation. Chris, you know, it's heard people say, oh, you're too small. You're too this, you're too that. And he just never let that bother him. And I think that's something he really kind of uses to fuel his fire. Um and like I said, be the competitor that he is. How much, uh, Josh, we'll start with you and we can go around the, the table, but uh, how much do you think it it affected him at the camp? I mean, uh, he wasn't the clearly, just by everybody analyzing the quarterback position, he wasn't the best quarterback there. Uh, he, I got the feeling from your evaluations, Josh, that maybe you've seen him make some throws that he missed uh, during the session. And, you know, it's always new receivers. It's better receivers, faster receivers. You haven't played with, you know, a lot of guys that are that good. But coming off Elite 11, doing satellite camp stuff, uh, throwing in that, and, and I know he admitted his arm was a little bit sore. How much do you think that affected him? I think it might have played a role. I mean, there was definitely – I didn't see quite the same zip that we saw in Dallas, which – you know, as you and Eddie know, were just awful conditions to throw in. Yeah, so, I he mean, was fantastic you know, you kinda, that day. You would expect to see a little bit more in a, you know, a contained environment like uh, the Georgia Dome or whatever that's called now. I realized I was calling that the wrong thing all weekend. But, you know, for me, what I noticed more kind of plays into the things I was just talking about. They were playing in seven on seven, and when things were going well, Robinson was grooving and he was just firing the ball and he looked perfect. I mean, Eddie and Joe can tell you the first play of their offensive uh, game in seven on seven in any of the games, he threw a deep ball for a touchdown. Uh, I believe it was to Mike Harley, yep. and you look like, okay, here they go. They're going to get rolling. Robinson went undefeated and won the title last year, as you and Eddie know, and you kind of thought, here it goes again. And he had a quarterback on his team, and for those that don't know, in this setup, you ought even the quarterback snaps. And so Robinson only was getting half the snaps, and I think the other quarterback struggling, he started to force some things, trying to make sure that he scored every time that it was his turn at the wheel. And I, I think it, he forced some things. He was trying to make too many things happen. And at times, you know, wasn't willing to just kind of take what was there and not hurt his team. And he threw a couple interceptions, made a few bad decisions. And like I said, I think that comes down to Chris not caring that this is an exhibition seven-on-seven -seven tournament that no one's really keeping score in and no one really cares about. He just wants to win in every setting, and that's kind of what came out. He's fine for it. But like I said, it was more of a 
decision making issue that I saw than uh, than maybe a fatigue. Joe, Joe well, let me ask you. I mean, that, that's a pretty good description. Right? Let me ask you, Joe, uh, being there watching that uh, most impressive Oklahoma commitment at the camp to you. To uh, to me, it's. Uh, I mean, Robinson and Bandy were the clear top two, but I, to most, the most impressive to me is Trajan Bandy. Uh, he was the guy that you walked out there and you looked at the defensive back group, and he was clearly one of the smaller guys there, if not the smallest. Uh, so you kind of wondered, okay, is this the area where we start to see his size catch up with him? You know, maybe his athleticism can't take over this kind of atmosphere with, atmosphere with these kinds of athletes, and Man, he, he, he displayed not only like that great burst and athleticism that you see on his tape that's just kind of that playmaking type of athlete, but he also has some great instincts at the position that I'm not sure I re- realized he had before. He was breaking in on routes before they were even uh, making the move. He would mix up his looks on receivers at times, and then, of course, you would see that, that burst and that closing speed, and you know a few times he would leave his feet to break up a play, and he was just a, a really all-around great competitor, and I think he really uh, solidified himself as one of the top just kind of overall athletes in the country. I think he, I don't know if it's cliche to say, but he just, he. I kind of walked away thinking that Trajan Bandy is a dog. He, he's yeah, kind of, he kind of, he got after it a lot. And uh, it was really kind of, it, it was disappointing that he ended up having cramps towards the end of the seven on seven session uh, because he really didn't get to play a whole lot in their, in their final game. And uh, his team, I think, made it to the semis, if I want to say that's right. I think that is right. He semis. Was on the green team, yeah. Yeah. And so he was, he was really impressive, though. Joe's completely right. He was probably the most impressive uh, OU commitment that if, was there. If we go with just looking at Tar. Is, is Marquise Hayes the guy that stood out the most that maybe surprised you guys uh, more than anyone? Start with you, Josh. Uh, yeah, he'd probably be on the short list. Um, I'd have to sit here and kind of think about who the guys were that really just uh, maybe went far and above what maybe I anticipated. I think and now that I've, I say that I bought myself a minute, the guy that to <laughs> me, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sitting here, I was like, well, let me, let me get around to it. The guy that to me really surprised me was Jacob Phillips. He was a guy that on tape, I thought as a junior looked a little stiff, kind of played upright. I thought in a camp setting where he's trying to cover these running backs out in space and running wheel routes, he was just going to look all over the place and wouldn't look right. But man, that's not what we saw. He was, to me, the only guy that was clearly better in coverage. And it, it really surprised me that he didn't win the MVP was Baron Browning. I thought Baron Browning, again, is just a freaky guy in coverage. The stuff he can do is is kind of unparalleled, in my opinion. But with Phillips, he he wasn't that far behind. He's just not quite as as fluid and as explosive as Browning. But as an inside linebacker, he's very natural in coverage and a guy that did very well against guys like Cam Akers and Najee Harris that were as probably as advanced as receivers out of the backfield as any guy I can think of probably since Joe Mixon. Yeah, I mean, he was Jacob Phillips was a good answer to that question because you know he's listed at six three two thirty one, I think, and Browning's listed at six three two thirty. So it shouldn't be, I guess, that big of a surprise to see them. They look very similar in their build to like well put together young athletes. But not only that, Phillips can cover in the way that Browning kind of can do. I mean, no one really is as athletic as athletic as Browning is, but Phillips was covering uh, Acres down the seam in one play. They they kind of cleared out the middle of the field isolated acres one-on-one with Phillips which looks like a clear win for the offense and he uh, matched him step for step down the seam and used his long arms to break up the pass and I thought man if he can cover a guy like that in one-on-one that might be a good future big 12 linebacker down the road if OU lands Phillips and Browning I am willing to uh, host a chat with uh, Tim Kish just telling everyone to go bleep themselves on Sooner Scoop they probably should I mean th- those are uh, those are two guys that I I can't remember physically uh, OU being able to go out and get two guys like that. I mean, Jacob Phillips is every bit as he's not as big as Baron Browning, but he's every bit as big as uh, as as tall as Browning, I guess I should say. And don't forget Tyler Taylor was there too, another guy that he yeah. ra- raved about, Tim Kish, and how he loved to uh, call him a goofball. I think, and he said that's okay. I'm a big goofball too. And so Tim Kish is uh, again in on a lot of linebackers this year. So we'll see if Kerry's right. Maybe he'll uh, be. Uh, smoking the old, old school Jay Norvell cigar at the end of the year to the haters. Don't Just got to close. Yeah, don't do that. That's can, not a, can you give the middle finger on air? Can you notice it? Like, I mean, is there some way, like, is there a noise we could make when the middle oh, finger I'll, is going? We'll, we'll we can find it. We'll do Scoop HD. We'll do photo. <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do, we'll bring the lighting. We'll, we'll get double gun salutes. That'd yeah. be awesome. Uh, well, in, 
you know, we were talking about Browning and, and just we all know how physically freakish he is. Uh, a lot of the people saw the video, uh, Scoop HD, of him coming up behind Chris Robinson. Uh, any with those linebackers? Any did you did you and not even just those linebackers, but anybody that that maybe you come out of that thinking, okay, OU's maybe a, a, a more serious candidate in this thing than I thought. I I kind of walked away thinking I guess and it might have just been our interaction with Marvin Wilson and I don't want to get people too excited but I think OU really does have a good shot at landing the nation's number one player and just uh, the way that he interacts with people uh, the way that even last night with uh, Jerry McCoy tweeting him and and that whole interaction on uh, Sunday or Monday night uh, he was kind of the guy that I kind of walked away thinking there was no way that uh, that Oklahoma really is a player for this kid, and and I walked away and and left Atlanta thinking maybe they really do have a chance at uh, landing the nation's number one. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Eddie. That uh, Marvin's a guy that uh, you know you, you thought OU was going. They're going to be a contender here. They're going to be in it. But when you're around him, you think uh, he speaks of OU the way that somebody would speak of a team that's going to be in it till the very end. And I think that's this is one that's going to be drawn out till National Signing Day, so it'll take a while. But you came out of that thinking OU's going to be there till the end. Another uh, defensive tackle that I thought was more interested than OU than I realized was Greg Rogers. You know, the the idea with him has always been USC, USC, USC. And then he kind of acknowledged that to us that uh, Coach Thibodeau says to him, hey, man, I hear you're all USC. And he says, no, no, that's, that's, that's not true at all. I'm completely open, and I love OU, and I'm going to try to visit. And So he seemed genuinely interested and open to everything and that he clearly liked and had a good relationship with uh, Coach Thibodeau and OU. So uh, that's a couple of defensive linemen right there. What about you, Josh? Anybody kind of surprise you with how much they're interested in OU? Well, you know, you guys go defensive line, and, and I agree with both of your points. Now, Rodgers is a guy that maybe I felt a little differently. I, you know, maybe I was too positive coming in. I felt like it had kind of pulled back. I really had the feeling it was USC and OU coming in and talking to him and talking to some people. I think UCLA is more of a contender, and obviously when another school becomes – a part of the equation, it changes, you know, uh, I guess the percentages you want to look at. But for me, the guy that really surprised me was uh, Adrian Ely. Talking to him uh, and, and talking to some people afterward, I, I had really kind of taken him as a guy that was, he's going to LSU, that's a done deal. But having some conversations, you know, just like we all did this weekend where you run into so many recruiting reporters and everybody's hearing things from their own sources and you can kind of collaborate and pull it all together into a little bit more of a cohesive um, idea, Oklahoma has a chance there. I mean, a very real chance. And I, and I know one source I talked to told me Oklahoma leads. So I, I, I don't know that I'm ready to go that far down the path, but – with Oklahoma's need at tackle, them really wanting to land an elite guy like that, you have to like what they can pitch him. And he's a guy that is talking about making one, maybe two visits up to Oklahoma before his uh, before the time he's going to decide. So you have to like where OU's at with that. But at the same time, you're talking about a Louisiana kid. And if LSU really comes in and really pushes hard, that that's just not a race OU wins very often, and that's you know no no fault to them. That's a, not a race many schools win. And you know I get a sense I I actually during that week, Josh, I got a call from someone saying, uh, "Hey, I, I I'm hearing that this Ely kid to Oklahoma uh, might happen the way things are going right now." Uh, I I get a sense, Josh, that even people that follow recruiting or or you know are out scouting are. Uh, really not concerned but i mean they're they're kind of surprised that lsu isn't pushing a little bit harder on this kid yeah you know it, it could be a situation to me not unlike um what we saw with cody ford a couple years ago where it seemed like everybody liked him really except for lsu his home state school now some of that you have to just say i mean the state of louisiana produces so many good offensive and defensive linemen to forget what they can go into Houston area and get or into Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, you know, go down the list of all the fertile recruiting grounds that they have access to. And, you know, you can understand, I mean, they've got to make choices, but a, a guy like that, I mean, Eddie and I and Eddie and Joe and I were talking, he was, I, I think they don't think, or I don't think there was much doubt, probably the biggest, longest offensive tackle there. Now he's, He's going to need a year to redshirt. He needs time. I understand all of that. But when you talk about a guy, uh, you know, really that fits the mold of, uh, of a guy that will grow into a six foot seven, 320 pound offensive tackle, it looks like Adrian Ely. I mean, he looks like a, 
like an NBA power forward right now. He's just a big, long, athletic guy that is so raw, but you, you know, you can just see him kind of oozing potential. Yeah, and he's another guy that uh, of a few guys that mentioned Orlando Brown as somebody yeah. that he's uh, yeah. looked up to and wants to talk to, and I, that's kind of a uh, something that you that the residual effect of having a big time year making the playoff and. Some of your guys are more nationally known, you know, now and then you kind of have somebody that a recruit can point to and say, okay, that's what I can be. And that's kind of what the success for OU has done because Eddie, everybody we talk to almost seemed to have like a positive opinion of OU, which kind of feeds into the Sooner Squad 17 success and all that. Yeah, they're definitely, they're, they're banking on the momentum that they made, uh, making the college football playoff, obviously. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it, it was interesting, though. You're right in the way that they used Orlando Brown and the way that uh, it seems like Orlando Brown is, uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if we ever clarified if he's reaching out to kids talking about it or if they just know the name and know, uh, know how big of a recruit he was coming out of high school, being able to start as a redshirt freshman. Uh, they, they definitely are making some inroads there. And uh, and he's kind of, I guess, officially has taken over the moniker of an Oklahoma left tackle being a national name, in-house name uh, that a lot of people know and a lot of people uh, or a lot of prospects look up to in uh, in his game and his style of play. I don't know if this is uh, this is a weird omen, maybe. But as we were talking yeah. about Adrian Ely, I was getting a call from our LSU publisher. That was very Mike ironic. Scarborough. It's very strange. I'm glad we're doing a podcast, so I don't have to talk to him. <laughs> Hopefully he doesn't hear this. So are they, wi- they wiretapping in on us? Do so they have that kind of money over uh, there? They've got, some, they've got some bucks, I think. Uh, okay, let me throw out a couple of names here, because I think these are the two names that were at the camp that the coaches, from what I've heard, they've, you know, they are the most confused about. And I know that you know, this is a staff, especially... We're talking defensive backs. I mean, Kerry Cooks is going to turn over every rock. And, and, you know, I had a chance to spend some time with him at summer camp. We were talking about Greg Bryant and stuff and the tragedy there uh, and, and getting to know him a little bit more. He's a guy I get the sense that he, he does not give up even when he feels like he's getting some resistance from a guy. And I think there has been a little resistance, more so on the, the, the case of Isaiah Pryor, whose dad played with Mike Stoops at Iowa. Uh, but I think, you know, they kind of wonder where they sit with Jeffrey Okuda a little bit as well. What, what do you guys uh, feel or hear when, like you said, Josh, you get around so many guys, you can kind of compare notes a little bit. What do you hear on those two guys? Well, with Pryor, he was a guy, you know, we talked about him last week, was a guy we kind of wanted to go in and interview and, you know, I told Joe and Eddie, and this was completely my call, so people up there, you know, people out there upset that we didn't talk to Pryor can certainly uh, throw tomatoes at me. Um, it, it was a deal where I didn't love that everybody was doing the same interviews on the same day during media day check-in, and we did about six on that day. And I said, let's, let's hold off. Let's do some, you know, in the stadium. It'll look cooler. It'll be a little more fun, and it may, you know, give these guys, guys a little time to decompress. You could just tell there was becoming a redundancy in the interviews and the things that were happening. And it, even if it was a day, it was just something different to look at, if nothing else. And for else. both so, of those guys, to be fair, that is their, they were both there last year. So they've been through yeah, this before. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and so with Pryor, I said, well, let's wait today, too. Well, within about five minutes of camp starting, Pryor hurts himself. And like we discussed last week, Pryor's not a guy that's exactly jovial to begin with. So to put an injury on it, we were, I was like, I think we might just steer clear of that conversation. We'll keep checking on that. But talking to people, I mean, it's going to take a lot for him to switch from Ohio State. He committed early. Obviously, you know, Urban Meyer and that whole crew, they've got it rolling right up there right now. And to me, it's interesting how these two seem connected because if Akuda comes on board, which of all the guys we interviewed, he's the one guy that I came away kind of saying, I, I don't know if Oklahoma really has a chance here. Like, you know, he's saying all the right things, and Oklahoma feels like home and all that sort of thing. But, you know, Oklahoma feels like home, and he hasn't been there in four months. So, you know, that 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 tells you something, you know, what, how much of that is, you know, kind of lip service and how much of that is real. So and for a guy that's we'll that s- close, I mean, we've seen other guys that have been up there four times, but, you know, since he's – He's been exact. There. I mean, last year, Chance Sylvie made the trip from uh, from Shreveport, what, five times in the spring? I mean, so, you know, and it's not to say that everybody has the same ability to make those trips. I understand 
travel is, you know, kind of it's an individual thing. Some guys can do a lot of it. Some guys can't. But to me, I mean, he, he's made trips to Ohio State at least twice since he's went to Oklahoma. So, I mean, that, you know, I, I think the writing's a little on the wall there. But at the same time, if he does choose Ohio State, does that open the door for Oklahoma to kind of go back in with Pryor and say, you know, hey, you, you know, this is the number, it's the number one safety in the whole country, man. Maybe, maybe you want to come look at us. Maybe we've got a little bit more available time for you. So that that to me is probably OU's best case scenario with those two guys, as, as I hear things and as I see them now. I'll just toss in a small positive, I guess, if if you're reading the tea leaves with Okuda and trying to see is there any sign he might have interest in OU. Uh, I mean, he and Trey Brown and the, the Oklahoma commits, they definitely seem to get along. They were hanging out uh, most of the weekend. and uh, Absolutely. And so maybe, I mean, you could tell he's at least comfortable with those guys, comfortable with OU in, in our interview. You know, he did say OU was like home, so at least there's that comfort level. Um, but like Josh said, he, I mean, even Okuda wasn't, uh, he wasn't shy about saying, you know, we said, you know, people think you're going to go to Ohio State. And he says, and we said, why, why would that be? Or, or Josh asked him that, and Jeffrey said, you know, probably because I tweet about Ohio State all the time. So, so either he's he's trolling people, which I wouldn't think would be the case with the kind of kid he is, or you know, he just genuinely likes Ohio State more. But I think the idea for OU is, you know, even if it's ninety percent Ohio State, you want to be the ten percent team. You know, you want to be the team that just in case it falls through, you'll be the choice. Guys, I I admit I I, I would love to have been there to to watch Trey Brown a little bit because I've seen him a couple of times. Uh, you know, when he did the the ill speed challenge, he more than anyone else blew me away with just his just his speed. Just when he broke into that that forty to watch him run down that sideline, I was like, "Holy Lord!" Like he accelerated like an insane person. But I'll also say at the same time, I see a little stiffness there when I when I watch him. How just keep guys? Give me your breakdown of, of how you thought Trey Brown performed. It was really tough. Trey Brown had a tough weekend, I thought. Uh, and I think that Joe and Joshua, I mean, yeah, Joe and Joshua would, uh, would agree with that. And just that it was it was an awkward situation for him. I don't think, you know, the time that we went up during the spring tour, he didn't participate uh, during spring practice or a whole lot of spring practice for Tulsa Union. So, you know, I think that maybe he was a little bit uh, just behind in that he hadn't worked out in a long time. Uh, he, he hadn't been in that situation in a while. But, uh, you know, he, he struggled in the morning, and sp- uh, particularly in the morning session. And uh, you could kind of see it on his, uh, he was kind of wearing it a little bit, just in that he got beat a couple times. I think he got down on himself a little bit. He even flipped over and played a little wide receiver for uh, for his team during the seven-on-seven portion during the evening uh, session. But uh, I thought it was a tough weekend. I don't know. What did you guys think? I mean, yeah, it, it's hard. to. For, I don't know how anybody could have been there. Even Trey, I don't know how he could think that that was uh, – uh, a, a great performance by any means you know he he got turned around a lot in one-on-ones uh, he he clearly seemed to struggle you know somebody on our, our board from uh, uh tulsa union said you know he's been practicing at receiver all spring he hasn't done any defensive back work and that might be part of the problem that this is he's kind of jumping back into some corner work but i mean even at receiver when he would go out there in one-on-ones we watched him and he ran a vertical route and he he couldn't get any separation you know i wondered if uh I, if this something about the the speed and the uptick in competition kind of uh, and he, he was being raw into the, those cornerback roles, he just kind of got down and could never really pick himself back up. Uh, I mean, Josh, he kind of had he started to do okay in the seven on sevens in the beginning, but then by the end of the day, he was back to being turned around. I think they even moved him to safety by the end of the day. Yeah, and, and interestingly, I thought he looked a at safety. Yeah, now, you know, I don't think. He fits all that well there. Yeah, but I mean, I, I thought he looked like he kind of got his feet back under him. I think Eddie hit it right on the head. Trey was, you know, we talked to him uh, Friday during check-in, and he was very confident. He wanted to go out and make an impression and tell, you know, kind of make it clear to everyone he's one of the top ten corners in the country. And I think when he didn't go out and it wasn't gangbusters from the start, he just – it looked like he got down on himself. He started kind of second-guessing himself. And at corner, man, you just can't do those kind of things. I mean, yeah, and he knows that. You know, that, that's the thing. People are going to hear this and think, oh, man, they're just burying Trey Brown. Trey Brown plays at Tulsa Union. He knows what the expectations are. He's been a big-time recruit since he was a sophomore. He knows this game. So th- there's nothing we're saying about him that he's not fully aware of. He knows it wasn't a good weekend. And, and I think, you know, like I said, I mean, the the issue, the, it, was kind of, it was a funny thing because the things – you came into the weekend thinking you knew about Trey Brown. 
first was Trey Brown's a little undersized, and the second was he's he's very fast. Well, I didn't have a problem with his size. No. When you when you stood him up there next to all the other corners, you thought, yeah, he looks good. He's fine. And then when I saw him turn and run, I wasn't seeing him track down guys. Or you know, when Joe talked about him moving to receiver, Joe and I were sitting there talking about it. you weren't seeing him create the separation that um, maybe a guy like Jeff Akuda did. A great example: Jeff Akuda came in, played the same position, ran a post pattern, separated from the corner, got an easy touchdown from Chris Robinson. You never saw Trey Brown really do that. I think he had a catch or two. They were both kind of underneath, and you know, it, it just you didn't see some of the kind of springy, bouncy explosion that you expected to see from him. And it made me wonder if some of the issues he was having in the spring, which I was told were a hamstring, but apparently he, he corrected me during a check-in that it was a knee. So, you know, maybe he's not all right from that. I, I'm not sure what it was, but I know, I know he knows he didn't have a good day, and at the same time I know that wasn't the best I've seen Trey Brown. So – it's kind of you don't want to make too much of it, but at the same time, I mean, you can't ignore that going against other elite guys. He, he looked he looked average. There's just no other way to say it. You know, it's 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 crazy because you know you 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 deal with recruiting, you deal with athletes, uh, you have all these guys that you can't wait to see them get to campus and and what they're going to do, and then they get there and they're as freshmen, they just don't get it. They just they just they're not ready. Uh, and I think a lot of that so many times is confidence. I look at. You know, somebody we saw last week, uh, twice so far this summer that I'd see him, and that's Josh Proctor. When we saw Proctor at the Rivals Challenge down in Dallas, he just looked like a big, tall, timid kid that really, you know, you couldn't have picked him out of a lineup. If you didn't know that was Josh Proctor, you would have said, oh, that was just some kid that probably will get you know, some offers somewhere. And then when we went to the Elite Camp, I saw an absolute monster that was step for step with every kid was yelling at guys was you know jumping out of his own skin trying to make plays every other i you know maybe you can attribute stuff when that happens with trey brown is just to be in an environment he's not familiar with going against people he's not familiar with and uh the confidence levels just all of a sudden take a quick dip and you don't look like the same player anymore. I think what Eddie said earlier about Trajan Bandy was a great point of contrast between him and Trey Brown. Like Trajan Bandy, you could put anybody in front of him, and what, like Eddie said, he was going to be a dog. He did not care. Whatever you threw in front of him, he was ready to compete and show what he had, and Trey just didn't have that same look. And you might attribute that to just one guy's from Oklahoma and one guy's from Miami. You know, when you're in Miami, you just see that stuff all the time. you got to be ready to do they that. They punch each other in one-on-ones at the rivals uh, Miami. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just scary, man. So I, I, you, you, well, you I just, mean, yeah, there you go, Josh. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, Joe. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say. So you got to have that. Uh, he didn't have the swag. You got to have that Bandy fighting had, yeah. spirit, man. You, and and I, that's something that, uh, like, I, I think Jacob Phillips had. Oh, Marvin Wilson had it in spades. I was I talked about uh, earlier how that after one rep he t- knocks his guy over, tackles the quarterback, the dummy for the quarterback, looks into a camera and says, "I'm a goon." That's a real life goon. A real life goon. That's uh, that's my kind of man. I right consider there. myself a real life goon as well. Joe got out of that without <laughs> using any funny words. <laughs> Yay! Uh, okay, Philly Augie, you guys got a chance to catch up with him really early, uh, and, and I know everybody that covers a Texas school down there. He's pretty. It seems like he's pretty much. He's he's willing to listen to whoever's going to come around, knowing that he's going to be moving. And it seems like this recruiting process for him is going to start as soon as he kind of gets settled in Texas. Was that kind of the impression you guys got? Josh, we'll start with you. Yeah, you know, and I, I can't remember. It's either today or Thursday that he actually moves to uh, Alado and kind of finishes that move. And I, I thought it was funny that he actually took a picture for our Texas high school site with all the Texas guys. So, I mean, you know, he's already <laughs> – He's in there, man. He sees himself that way, and that's the way he's going to handle it. And, you know, and Joe and Eddie, you know, you guys were there. He was great to talk to. He's a good kid. Um, I, I think people thought we were a little down on him, and I, I feel like I should clarify that. In the morning session, he just didn't take many reps. Right. It wasn't that he was bad or that there were any real problems. You just wanted to see him go after it a little bit more, be a little bit more competitive than he was. And I thought in the afternoon session – you saw him correct it. You saw him get more, you know, he took more reps, win him more one-on-ones. And 
I, he looked fine. There was no problem with it. I, I think he's probably almost certainly a right tackle in the call game. I think we all kind of figured that out. But at his size, I think that was inev- inevitable. But at this, like I said, I, I don't want people to get this impression that we didn't like Filiaga. He just didn't go a lot, and so you kind of had to say, well, why isn't he? And that, that kind of becomes a question of, was well, he going to come here and compete, or what's he doing? And then in the afternoon, I feel like he kind of got his rhythm going. Yeah, I mean, we were watching him. It might have been his very first rep in the afternoon session after we kind of had wondered, right, this guy's hanging in the back, he's not coming in. So this very first rep in the afternoon session, uh, he, he takes a kickback on an edge rush and then smashes the guy with a hard punch in the chest and almost knocks him over. And Josh and I kind of looked at each other and said, okay, all right, Chuck's bringing a little something here to the afternoon session. So that was, that was good to see because, like Josh said, when, when what we were saying in the first session wasn't that he looked bad or it was quite the opposite. He looked very impressive. It was just that we wanted to see him get into these reps and stop hanging back and compete a little bit. And he did that a little more in the afternoon session. Well, and I, you know, I just watched you guys' video, uh, just going watching him go through, you know, agility drills and things. You know, just comparing him to some of the guys like Bray Walker that we saw uh, at OU's elite camp, uh, the Condon kid. Uh, he is, he's got elite athleticism for a guy that's that big. Yeah, very much so. He he's a guy that it, we we even talked about it a little bit just in that uh you know, if you throw the the big names of Oklahoma offensive linemen out there and they're all really talented kids, uh you know, the Bray Walkers, uh Bryce Bray, uh the just anybody, uh, uh Owen Condon, any of the guys that we've seen here in the last couple of weeks uh that that are big body kids and you know, the bigger kids of the 2018 2019 classes uh 2017 2018 i mean here in oklahoma uh you throw them in the situation that they were in uh that they would have been in in atlanta and it's 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 mind-blowing to think that bray walker would have been not one of the quote-unquote smaller kids out there but his size you think of him as just being a monster in okay preps ball and uh put in that situation out there it's a it's a little different Uh, the guys that are out there are just they're the best of the best the elite guys in uh in this in these 2017 and 2018 classes and uh it's just a different world when you step out of the oklahoma bubble and so uh yeah i thought chuck filiaga though is uh as you guys said he's not we're not bagging on the kid. He just had a rough. He just had a rough outing, and you can't base a kid, uh, a guy's future on uh, two, three hours of one-on-one work. I mean, it's, there's a lot more that goes into that. So, uh, I, I liked him. I think he's uh, he was a great interview too. I'd love for uh, just that side of the uh, the fact for him to uh, to make it to Norman, and be able to interview a guy like that. Yeah, he might. Uh, if he does end up going to OU, he would be the new Gabe Eichert, Ty Darlington put him in front of the camera he's he's a really really good interview i can deal with that okay uh just just watching it it, it unfold uh let's talk about uh big marv number one recruit in the country uh just i mean you already talked about you know how kind of if you were sleeping on oklahoma being a, a real factor for him stop because they re- they really do appear to be that uh and josh you even had a really interesting interaction with gerald mccoy last night online uh, about uh, your days covering his recruitment and him reaching out to to, to Marvin Wilson and and I mean just but just overall watching him compete in this thing I don't know that you could be surprised by what you see you've seen him in person in high school but just just let's go around the table talk about your overall thoughts on his performance at the camp. Well, you know, I'll just jump in just because I, first of all I'm shocked that that entire Gerald McCoy thing didn't become an old man Josh hashtag or anything like that. I mean, I have not heard any. It was very impressive. I'm just going to say it, it was. A f- I was proud of you, Josh. <laughs> I was proud to be associated with you, and I didn't feel like it was time for piling on. Well, okay, well, I mean, you know, and I certainly acknowledge those moments don't come along very often. So enjoy the the proud Josh moments because they are rare. But he's actually going to be the godfather as- from our next child. <laughs> So see, there we go. Now, now I feel more comfortable going into this. I don't know how to do with praise, so now I feel better. But are you guys no, really, trying for the know, next child yet? Uh, no, 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 no. That and you know, surprisingly, that's as much on Mama's side as me. So that's um, sh- she wanted to have like four when we met. So this is this has been a real change of uh of scenery. But one will will affect your view on the world a lot. So. <laughs> 
to try and bring it back from that, though, uh, really, you know, Marvin, um, fr- uh, people, you know, I, I've heard people saying, oh, you know, we saw him get beat by Marquise Hayes and we saw him get beat by Alex Leatherwood. Well, first, those guys are really good players. Yeah. Secondly, you're talking about a guy that, Eddie Joe, what would you estimate, 50, 60 reps he took? I mean, clearly more than anybody else I saw. It, it, it wasn't even close. It was it was and, unbelievable to see him just keep going back in there every time to uh, to get reps. I, I I mean he's the number one player in the country, and it felt like he was out there pro- wanting to prove that he he holds that title. Yeah, I mean when guys are yeah. coming after him, Tory Johnson would talk smack, and Marvin would say, "All right, put me back in there." And I, that, that stuff, man, that just kind of makes that's that intangible stuff that you just gotta love. The the story that I love that you just would never know if you weren't there was the guy, and I don't even know who it was. One of the, uh, for people that don't know, when they get into that big man challenge, they break off into teams just like they do seven on seven. They're the same, same a lot. You know, they go with the jersey colors and they have four separate teams. Well, you go head to head. You know, the one team's offensive lineman try to deal with the other team's defensive lineman and vice versa. Well, at one point, Marvin's had to go four or five reps because a few of his other defensive linemen are nicked or hurt or something. So they're, they're having to do these matchups against Marvin over and over again. Well, the other team's defensive lineman like jumps on the guy that's setting up the matchups. Uh, offensive line coach used to play for the Cowboys, a guy named George Hegeman. And he's just in Hegeman's face about how unfair this is because Wilson's the best player in the country and he's getting wins every time and they're going to win because Marvin, ha- you know, he goes, if, if Marvin goes, it's a win. And he's screaming about it right in front of his offensive linemen that are trying to deal with Marvin Wilson and are just getting killed. And you're like, man, you know, that's I don't know if that's disrespected for the offensive line or total respect for Marvin. But either way, I mean, like you you could tell they all know he's really good. You know, we we there's times when we kind of fall in love with a guy and then you talk to players. and They're like, oh, that dude's trash. He's not anything. But there wasn't anybody there that's not like Marvin's the man. You know, they, they all know he's he's just special. Yeah, I think I mean all the talk about Marquis stopping him. We talked to Marquise, and the, I think the way he put it, he was he was kind of praising himself, and this is how he praised himself was, yeah, I, I got I stopped Marvin like a couple times, like a couple, like that's how he, he thought like, hey, that, I was doing good. I stopped him a couple times, you know. So that's that's how impressive Marvin was. If you got him once or twice, you counted that as, hey, man, I I showed my stuff. All right, uh, guys. Any, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, recent commitments. Uh, Sooner Squad seventeen getting a little bit bigger. I want to hit on the elite camp, but anything, uh, uh, Josh, you wanted to hit on about uh, Atlanta before uh, we move on a little bit. You know, probably for me, one of the interesting stories, and, I, and I, we're probably going to cover it a little bit more in scoop, is um, James Robinson, the wide receiver from Florida, is a guy that didn't have a very good day. So I understand why may not be over the moon about this news but i think oklahoma may have a chance there if they want to have a chance there are there are some things around him he's a kid kind of like Darnell solomon last year from miami gotten you know he's had a few little run-ins off the field not anything terrible nothing you know that it's going to end up uh putting him in a bad spot it's just kind of public perception things that are not, not going to always be well received and so i don't know if oklahoma is going to push hard for him or not but if they do, I, I think they absolutely have a chance with him. And you're talking about a guy, when you watch his tape, that's a five-star on tape. He didn't look at this weekend at camp, but when the lights go on, that guy makes some big-time plays in Florida high school football. So, that, you know, it's just something you can't ignore. And it can't help the fact to, uh, to think just kind of going even more on the James Robinson fact is that uh, he worked out with Chris Robinson all week. Yeah, and everybody absolutely. Yeah, you know, I mean, he was on that. Yeah, on that blue team. Yeah, and everybody got a. I know some people might not have been on that high on Robinson, but I could tell you that that the perception from the players was that Robinson was one of the top two quarterbacks there, and uh, he and it, maybe that part of that was his personality and how well he got along with guys. But even so, that that still counts. And so, being around him is always a positive for Oklahoma. I promise that. Let me ask you uh, on 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 Marquise Hayes. Um, I mean, Oklahoma offered him shortly after the Kansas City camp. I think K State came in right there too. But you see all these people now that are like, you know, like I, I remember seeing our Nebraska guys that are like, "Well, look at this guy. Mm-hmm. Nebraska hasn't offered." Uh, you think that he's in a place where he's just going to take it all in and and let the offers come and take his time with it, being that he's just now blowing up like he is. 
I don't know. That's I, certainly the impression I got. I don't know. I think Marquise, uh, I think if Oklahoma jumps in here pretty quickly and puts the full court press on, I, I think that's something that uh, if they do that now, then there's a shot. But if they if somebody waits much longer, then he's going to draw this thing out. And then and people are going to have to pay because that kid's going to get a ton more offers. Wouldn't you have to say? I mean, that, not just Oklahoma and Nebraska. There might be a lot more teams from coast to coast coming by to see Marquise. I, what was it, Josh? You said that right after the Kansas City camp that uh, – here we do we want to talk that Bill Beatenbow came down and saw him so I think that he's somebody that's about to blow up I, th- I just thought it was really interesting that he was such a, a late addition and, and nobody really knew about him until that Kansas City camp and I think I made the I even made the comment to you Josh uh, before the uh, before everything got started on Saturday morning was uh, you know I wouldn't be surprised if uh, I yeah, I said this. Okay, <laughs> I, I I think I said I, something to the effect of I wouldn't be surprised if he came out here and just got his ass kicked all weekend. Just being that I you, nobody really knew a whole lot about him, and that rivals came to city camp was kind of down. And he's he's he's, he's a strange looking kid. He's I not mean, the prettiest. He's looking. got really long arms. Mm-hmm. He's got really long legs. Uh, he's got you know a high butt. He doesn't look to be like a power lift guy type of guy. No, not at all. But I mean. He has a lot of power in his arms. I mean, he was, he was stonewalling power. guys left and right. It was the his first his first rep in one on one. I mean, his first he, he punched. I forgot who it was, uh, but he came out of a stance, punched the guy, and I mean, I think even the the kid that he was going against kind of was taken aback by like holy holy crap, this guy just punched me pretty hard. And so um, I thought he had a really really good camp. I walked away thinking that I was completely wrong with what I said or what I predicted and that. Uh, he had an exceptional weekend, I thought. Well, he didn't uh, just... I mean, at Kansas City, from the reps I watched, it's not like he just dominated no. every single kid. Mm-hmm. I mean, when they started going through their little competition at the end, I think he won both of his things pretty convincingly. But there were guys that were able to get by him during that day, during that practice, during that, that Rivals Challenge day. I think teams... Uh, not teams, players just... You know, a logistic problem with his wide body and long arms just to create a nightmare for guys to get around. And and since he does, he did do a good job that day in Atlanta of keeping a wide base and staying strong in that. You're not going to go through him. He's six, seven, three hundred plus pounds or whatever. And if he can use his wide body and his long arms in that tight space in the interior, he's going to be a nightmare for teams to try to deal with at guard. I think he's going to be a really, really good player. Did you look at his offers going in? I mean, I'm just looking at his offer sheet right now. I mean, Illinois, Illinois State, Iowa State, uh, Miami of Ohio, Minnesota, New Mexico, Northern Iowa, Western Michigan. But these we've talked I mean, about this before. These are no, all co- that's not. They, those teams have no shot anymore. Yeah, they're done. No. Yeah, they're done. It's, it's a copycat. Uh, type of system and once one of those dominoes falls they're all about to fall all right well uh oh you had their elite camp which i thought uh turnout was outstanding um mm-hmm. got to see a lot of bigs uh, as we said bray walker i think was the most surprising thing that he actually came in and worked yeah, out you don't see that very much uh <laughs> well we should have seen him in atlanta but uh he didn't like to work out so we didn't <laughs> uh so I, I mean, Eddie, I want you to talk about this to start off, but the defensive back group. I mean, I was standing there uh, and uh, just John, you know, talking it up with Mike Stoops a little bit, and you could tell how impressed he was by the kids that they brought in it, it, in the defensive back group. Yeah, it was really good. Uh, you you start at the top and you go with uh, the two Owasso kids, uh, Josh Proctor, Wayne Jones. That's going to be an extremely good secondary oh, for the Rams man. come this fall. If uh, if they can get anybody up front to, uh, to hold people up, uh, they'll be making plays all year. And then uh, you kind of work your way back into the uh, back end. And even Daxton Hill, a kid that uh, really hasn't even played that much of varsity ball for Booker T, a guy that we were really, really impressed with during our spring tour. Josh and I were. Uh, he he had a, a decent day when I went back and looked at the tape uh, at the Scoop HD video of it. I thought that I kind of walked it out thinking that he didn't have a very good day, but uh, went back and he had a really a good day. Uh, it was kind of the opposite of what I thought. Uh, but Josh Proctor was by far, in a way, an OU offer guy that is extremely good in that uh, 2018 class coming out of a And really just watching him go through drills and the quickness of his feet uh, I had, I had, I, I would, you kind of question, okay, guys, that big, that young, uh, you know, maybe he, he doesn't have the chops that other guys have. He, he's, he's the best athlete. I mean, that was in the camp, I thought. And even to add on that, you were talking about how Mike Stoops was so impressed with him. I think it was towards the end of pre- of the uh, one-on-one session and, uh, and Josh Proctor's trying to go back out there and get a couple more drills. And Mike Stoops was yeah. like, 
Eh, Josh, it's all right. We know we know what you can do. You don't need to go back out there anymore. We're about done. Well, and I was, you know, talking about uh, DBs, Joe, I was most impressed with the, I don't even know the kid's name, the receiver out of uh, Moore. I think the War 85, the big, tall, lanky kid. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a really good day. Uh, it's, uh, I, I, he, Emmett he was Grayson. a kid that, the, so what? Emmett Grayson. Is that it? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, he was yeah, he, immigration for more. He more was JD actually. He was yeah, that's right. He he was searching guys out, calling guys out. I mean, he was searching out Josh Proctor, and they were going at it. Uh, but he's a guy I really want to get a, a, a harder look at yeah. this next year. Big physical guy. I mean, I, I was kind of impressed with how he used his body, and uh, uh, he was not he was not afraid to go up against anybody all day. He was somebody that you kept say, looking back and saying like, oh, okay, who's that? Who's that? Oh, that's the more guy. Okay, over and over and again all day. You kind of kept saying that to yourself. Oh, another guy that I thought we also uh, missed out a little bit, uh, forgot about Jordan Roberts from Ardmore is mm-hmm. another kid that was at that camp. That's another just kind of extremely athletic defensive back in the state of Oklahoma next year. I, it's going to be a lot of fun to, uh, watching, especially with you have like Casey Thompson at Southmore and some great offensive weapons in the state next year too. I, it'll be a lot of fun to watch uh, some guys on the outside. Kind of that uh, fourth guy that I wanted to add that I thought had a really good day that we thought uh, was pretty impressive when we stopped by there. And Trey Brown gets a lot of talk in the Tulsa Union secondary, but Patrick Fields yeah, had Fields. a really good day yeah. as well. Uh, he's kind of I a could, 2018 guy that people need to keep an eye on. I could see from afar uh, Mike Stoops just drooling over that kid. I mean, they really were putting a lot of attention on him. They they love that kid. Yeah, I th- I, th- I still think I don't know if I've put out the uh, the highlights of him. I need that's something that I need to get around to uh, because he really did have a good day at the elite camp on. Uh, I guess almost a week ago, last Wednesday. And we mentioned Josh Proctor, the guy uh, from Owasso 2018 with the OU offer, and he was at the underclassmen uh, challenge in Atlanta on Sunday, and we got a chance to look at him up close. And we can tell you, Eddie and I saw him, Josh saw him. He he looked like not only did he belong, but he was one of the more physically impressive guys in the secondary there. And uh, the coaches on hand, you know, they're kind of tough on these kids. They're they're trying to you know get these kids get their competitive juices going, so they're hard on them going through the drills. But every time Proctor would come up, the coach would have to go, oh, okay, yeah, that's all right. I like that. I, nice reach there. Nice hit there. So he's somebody that not only has that impressive size and frame, but he 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 looked like he belonged and he looked really smooth. He's really starting to mature too, which I think is. And he's got you know they've got tough coaches up at Owasso that really mm-hmm. are demanding. So I don't worry about his development or his maturity, but. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, I've just seen him ever since the Dallas Rivals. It seems like he's made more progress than any, any one kid that I've, I've paid attention and to. And, Josh, we were talking about this in Atlanta. Is he somebody that you think uh, he, he kind of wraps up his recruiting soon, or does he draw it out more like Stephen Parker a few years ago at Jinx? And I think we lost Josh. Oh, okay. Yeah, he just – did you see that Twitter message he just sent? Uh, yes, I just did see that. We can. That makes sense. I was like, Josh isn't talking a lot. I got to make sure to get him involved right here. We can. Uh, well, I tell you what. I mean, I think I think we're we're probably pretty good. We're we're over an hour or so now on the podcast. But um, uh, I I would just say, I mean, you know, guys. One thing I wanted to say is what's kind of surprised me a little bit is um, the fact that we didn't really see a whole lot of quarterbacks this summer. Other than, you know, when you go into national camps, obviously you're going to see a lot of them, but that were in Norman. I, and like I said, I've been up in Baltimore or wherever doing the Under Armour stuff, so I know it's it's nothing new. But, you know, last time I was covering summer camps, it was kind of like, you know, Justice Hansen's mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, Gerard Hurd's and guys like that coming through. I Maybe you just have to give a lot of credit to Lincoln Riley for, you know, identifying guys that are younger and bringing. I mean, Casey Thompson came into camp, but he didn't work yeah. out. Uh, but you had the kid from um, from Hebron that, that worked oh, out. Oh, yeah, from uh, Clay- the, Clayton Toon. Yeah, the Toon kid was really the only elite quarterback we saw in Norman over, I think the, it, it, over it, the summer. I think you hit it on the head. It's probably a product of uh, Lincoln Riley identifying who he wants to go after. And then I think it's also a product of uh, Oklahoma just not really being in the market for a quarterback. You, you look at what Baker Mayfield, he has two more years now. You have Austin Kendall already on campus. You have uh, Kyler Murray on campus. You have uh, Chris Robinson coming in January so I, I I really don't think that they just they're not in a situation where they're needing to bring kids in and uh, maybe as opposed to what they were a couple years ago when you really didn't know who the quarterback was going to be uh, you didn't really have a direction of the offense and uh, it certainly kind of goes into uh, the category of of what Oklahoma's done as a whole with the recruiting and that 
they have an idea, they know what they want to do, and they're going out and getting the guys that they want. And I think that that has a lot to do with uh, with Lincoln Riley and the organization that they have now in recruiting quarterbacks. To me, yeah, that's just any a, position a, really. A testament, basically. I mean, for a quarterback, you got to recruit one guy a year, uh, essentially. And Lincoln Riley every year seems to get one of his guys. You know, first couple of guys he offers, and he's already wrapped up in 2017 with Chris Robinson. Uh, you look at 2018; it's not a sure thing by any means. But Casey Thompson's only a few miles up the road, and he's offered, and he's a legacy, and his brother played there, and so they can feel like, hey, we can wait that out with Casey. We can work him a little bit. Like we said, he was at the camp uh, visiting OU. That's going to be something he'll probably do a lot because of convenience. And over time, they might start to convince him to to come to Norman. And, you know, Clayton Toon was there and he's from Hebron. And to me, that makes sense as a guy who's he's in the region. He's in the Texas Dallas area. He throws a very good ball, as Eddie can attest to. It's, it's, it's something that really pops out of the hand. And if for whatever reason, uh, Casey Thompson doesn't uh, work through. Uh, Clayton Toon is somebody that I think that Lincoln Riley would probably feel comfortable with falling back on. I think Eddie even said that he wouldn't be surprised uh, by the end of this process if he doesn't get an offer. Well, yeah, and, and I think you know the interesting thing to me about 2019 and, and beyond is 18. It seems like they are keeping their options open and offering more guys and maybe sitting there. They, the, I think they're kind of planning ahead almost to say well, what if, what if we need to offer two quarterbacks that year? What if, what if we lose a guy? Or what if somebody transfers? And it, I think they're being real smart about it. Yeah, I mean, uh, we were talking about this with Chris Robison earlier about what Baker Mayfield coming back means. And to me, that's always been great news for Chris Robison because, like Josh said, now he gets that year on campus to catch up to Kyler Murray and Austin Kendall because otherwise, if Baker Mayfield leaves after this year, you're going to be coming in as Chris Robison as a true freshman up against two guys that have been in the system for a year competing for the starting job. And once you lose it, it becomes very hard to gain it back. And now he's going to come in with an opportunity to win that job, and let's say Chris Robinson wins that job, then you have Austin Kendall and Kyler Murray who are sitting there. They're going to look like prime candidates to transfer, and oh, you may need to offer a couple guys in a year. So I think that's a great point, Carrie, about how they're they're not setting themselves up for disaster. They're keeping their options open, which has really kind of been the M.O. the last few years uh, with uh, Bob Stoops' new hires. Now, uh, Eddie, I know you you in the past, you've, you've been a part of the, uh, the satellite camps down in Dallas. Was it... Mm-hmm. This year, just kind of not a great turnout. No, it, it really wasn't. It, it, I mean, last year you had Charleston Rambo and uh, Chris Robinson. Those were kind of our first times that we really were able to see him. And uh, this year, you just didn't really get that feel that I don't know. You didn't really get the feel that there was a whole lot of guys out there that are going to be quote unquote Oklahoma guys in the end. I think it was more of a, a a good look to get in front of coaches from Sam Houston State, a good look to get in front of coaches from the Duke Mississippi uh, State. Mississippi State. Yeah. Uh, it, I, so I don't know. I, I just didn't see a whole lot of guys down there. That we saw a couple familiar faces, but you didn't really see any guys that Oklahoma could say that that kid's going to end up being in Norman uh, in the near future. And I think the one thing that's interesting about this class is it's so put together so far they're not really, you know, I don't think Oklahoma is really worried so much about turning over rocks at this point. Whereas in the past, they might have brought out four or five kids at receiver mm-hmm. DB that they really didn't know about that, you know, might have might have been looking at TCU or, you know, had an SMU offer, maybe trying to look to get into that next tier. And they don't really need to get those kind of kids, I mean, to evaluate right now the way things are going. They, they just don't have enough spots. Yeah. yeah. A great example of that is at the uh, Challenge in Atlanta this weekend, uh, Trajan Bandy comes up to me, hands me a receiver. He says, hey, man, this guy wants an OU offer. This guy right here, he wants an OU offer. And it's uh, Mike Harley, a Rivals 250 wide receiver who played well enough. He caught the opening touchdown pass from Chris Robinson. I think he was on Josh's uh, Hot 11 for uh, offensive performers from the camp. But we were talking, and we just kind of said, I, I mean, oh, you might hear that and think, I mean, okay, we'll remember that, but we like what we have at receiver. We like the options we have. They still have C.D. Lamb sitting out there, Omar Manning. So I, if they're recruiting that well that Rivals 250 guys kind of haven't asked for OU offers, and OU might not even have to follow up on that. That's a sign of, I mean, this 2017 class has just kind of taken off. It, it just goes all the way back to just the, I think, the organization and, and what they're doing, the the idea and the thought process of what they're uh, what they're trying to do. It's not 
just throwing out offers to anybody anymore. It's a it's it's a complex idea of we want this guy, this guy, this guy, and they are kind of sticking to a plan, I guess, more so than uh, anything you've ever ever seen or have seen in the last couple of years from Oklahoma. I think the thing I, I noticed this the other day um, is somebody. I think I saw somebody had tweeted something out with Josh Heupel in it, and he was at a camp, maybe something like that. And so I clicked on his page, and he had retweeted all this stuff. Like, and there was this thing about it was a, one of those kind of cards, like a, a recruiting card mm-hmm. of Jackie Ship, and it listed all the players that he coached over the years. And like six out of this, it was like Gerald McCoy, Tommy Harris, like all these guys from Oklahoma. And it just stopped. Like he was still coaching at Oklahoma, and the players that he was known for coaching had stopped at one point. Mm-hmm. And it's just it's been amazing because I I don't want to I don't want to Jim Traber it here, but I'll pat myself on the back a little bit because I told people last summer at this time when they were freaking out after watching how hard those coaches were working at satellite camps, like this staff is going to be able to recruit. I knew that Kerry Cooks had an energy that they had they didn't have when Bobby Jack Wright was there. I know when I saw Brent Venables here and watch him in summer camps and watch the way that he recruited that that was a big blow to them. So when they got a Kerry Cooks in, when they got a Lincoln Riley, when they got a, a Calvin Thibodeau, I mean, those are all guys that are dynamic that aren't just going to give up because they're not they don't feel like they they are, you know, moving up the leaderboard. Mm-hmm. So it's starting to pay off. It, it, it's it, it's it's taken some patience for people, and some people haven't had the patience. But you're starting to see now that you know the moves that Bob Stoops made. They uh, pretty much every one of them have been fantastic. Yeah, and like I like I said before, I, I don't think any of that uh, matters if they don't play well on the football field and having a big year like they had last year. You know, people worried about that 2016 class. You know, we just made a play. Oh, you just made a playoff run, and uh, that these fans are saying, "Hey, we made the playoff run. Where, where's this big recruiting class?" And it, 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 sometimes it takes a year, you know, for these kids to sit at home and sit, watch these games and it soak in. That yeah, oh, people are, that didn't follow recruiting, they just figured it would happen overnight in right. like February. These relationships take all time. these kids would decommit from these schools they'd been committed to since the summer. It doesn't work like that. No, this is when it pays off for you if you're doing it right. So. This isn't Baylor. People just don't leave. <laughs> well, disaster program. That'll probably be a subject of the our next podcast. Is at some point these guys from Baylor are gonna have to be released. Yeah, or they're gonna fight to be released or whatever. But I mean, it could take through July and August. I mean, we didn't know how the clearinghouse works or the uh, infrag not the uh, I'm tra- the eligibility committee. I mean, we saw it with Devontae Lampkin a year ago. So yeah, it, it takes time. What the heck? I mean, no one no one knows what the heck the NCAA is doing. So, but that could be decided tomorrow. We know more or... what the NCAA is doing than we do what Baylor's doing. I'll say that, and that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, but yeah, it was great, you guys. I mean, unbelievable work over the last week. Uh, we ran you ragged, and uh, uh, thank God you're young and not old like me. Uh, so you you lived through it. You got the you got the fanboy, David Ross's family at the Atlanta airport. Yeah, got to throw. Which I think the Atlanta airport gets a bad rap, by the way. I don't think it's that bad. Not not bad at all. We had a good time. Yeah, we had a good time. It's good for people watching. We had a, I had a. We you had see a, like the rednecks, and then you see the high society people. Like the, it's it's such a hub. You see a little bit of everything. It is it is a nice melting pot. You know, it's a great group of people we we met a lot of nice people we had a lot of fun with how uh, drunk were you by the time that night ended uh not <laughs> drunk enough to not drive home at midnight when i got back to dallas so <laughs> or one whenever we got back it I, was I, I felt joe was a little loopy getting on the plane when he started comparing you to marvin lewis <laughs> <laughs> we uh we had a party bro, too Wilson, we, I mean. we all got liquor on the uh on the flight home yeah that's so not, it was that, fun that's uh <laughs> That's God. it was beer at the airport, uh, liquor on the flight. So, were there was it like a pissed off flight too? It was like everyone just no, everybody was pretty cool. I mean, uh, we ended up uh, talking to a guy that is uh, the head of officiating or something soccer, for North Texas soccer. soccer. Yeah, he turned out to be a pretty good guy, and hmm. so uh, it was he it was really in your row. Uh, no, he just we met up with him at the bar, and <laughs> at, he was at a row at the bar headed to Dallas as well. He lives in Plano, so uh, there was a lot of uh, Dallas folks on the uh. I guess obviously there was a lot of Dallas folks on the flight, but it wasn't too bad. It wasn't bars, bad at all. Bars make airports tolerable. 
Oh, they they need more of them. They just need to bring the prices down. Yeah, that's the that's problem. the only worst yeah, part. I had a, I had I think an eight hour layover coming back from Miami because you had gone I think an earlier flight that day. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, no, and then I, I had a later flight, and they switched my plane to like an eight hour later plane. And the bar saved my life. Yeah, I, almost, I got to sit there and watch bowl games. I almost missed my flight that morning. That was yeah, you. That was. Scary. I thought you were going to miss your flight. Well, I. That's just that's a whole a, different story. You took a taxi like the airport was forty five minutes away. You took a taxi like an hour uh, from when your flight left. Yeah, it's because those Somehow OU Daily made... kids were like, "Well, you want to just ride with us to the airport?" And I was like, "Yeah, that's fine." And uh, so we, they were like, "Well, what time you want to leave?" And I, I was like, I don't know what time is good for you guys. They were like, 6.30 is cool. And so I was like, yeah, let's do that. And I'm, my flight was at 8 and didn't even think that, oh, we have a 45-minute drive, plus the fact that we're going to two separate airports. They didn't tell me that they were going to uh, the local one, not Miami International. Oh, God. So that was – it was all right, though. Got on the flight, got home by noon, and it was a good day. Slept forever. Did yeah. you guys just sleep all day Monday? Yeah. For yeah. the most part. Yeah, I, I I think I had promised on Sunday that I would get my uh, breakdown of Jeremiah Hall up Monday, and uh, I, f- I finally got it up, I think, like at 7 at night, <laughs> <laughs> and that wasn't too far from when I was up and getting around. Before so. we get out of here, any thoughts on Jeremiah Hall? Uh, I mean, he's going to fit right in. I, I think uh, I put in my breakdown that he everything that you want to check off of your checklist of what you want from an H back and OU system, he really kind of, he hits one of those things. You know, he's, he's, he's savvy. There's multiple plays where he kind of has to do that deceptive work. You need to as an H back fake the blocks about for a pass, fake the inside route, go out into the flat. Uh, he's clearly an athletic guy. He has a 90 yard touchdown reception. Uh, he has like a 20 yard touchdown run. Uh, so, you know, he can, he can catch the ball to the backfield. He can run it. And he, he looks like a good lead blocker. He stays behind his pad, stays low, knows how to win his shoulder and, and uh, finish a block. So uh, there's everything you need really right there to fit right in with uh, Dimitri Flowers, Trey Millard, and J.D. Runnels. All right. Uh, that's going to do it for this edition of the Unofficial 40. Uh, if you're wondering where Josh McQuistion is, uh, he had to book out a little bit early and he was having some connection issues. So uh, uh, we got we got our money's worth out of him. So uh, for Josh McQuistion, for Eddie Radosevich, for Joe Duvall. I'm Kerry Murdoch, and we'll see you next time here back on the Unofficial 40 podcast from Soonerscoop.com.